Hello everybody, my name is Jeff H. Mellon and welcome to uh, this week's lecture in the lecture series called British Literary Analysis, where we will today have a look at an example of old English literature. This is our introduction, one of two parts of uh, our old English literature lectures. And today we will have a look at the text Beowulf. I hope you can read it. I know it's a little uh, tiny up here. Um, this week's session will probably be the longest of them all. So if you see, I don't know, that this is um, over an hour long, I'm very sorry, but please uh, don't be um, dismotivated by that. The next ones will be shorter, but today I will um, you know, this is our first literary analysis, and I really want you to understand how we are dealing with that. Um, so I will take some more time today. Um, yeah, it might also be the case uh, that I might change outfits in between and change uh, the daytime in between because I might um, capture the second half of uh, the lesson, uh, the lecture on another day. Uh, so please don't be confused if there's like a hard cut in between and um, I suddenly look completely different. Also, I have to say uh, I was ill for a couple of days, so my voice might be a little cracking and I might look a little tired and, and stuff. Um, I, I think I'm healthy again, um, but it's still like, you know, those days after you had a cold, um, you still sometimes feel wet. Um, however, I wanted to do this lecture today, and I'm also sorry if my uh, American English sometimes turns into British English today. I've been binge watching Downton Abbey for a while and um, constantly thinking about Maggie Smith's character there. And uh, yeah, she's very British in that regard. So um, if my brain suddenly tries to uh, imitate her, then I'm very sorry in advance. I'll uh, try not to do that. Okay, so. Um, let us come to today's agenda. We will start with a short, very short recap of uh, last week's session. Um, since it was so different in topic, um, it will only be a short recap. But then I want to, as I just said, I will try to um, explain to you again a little more on how deeply we will analyze texts. Um, I think you will realize that when we speak about Beowulf today, but I also want to be as transparent as possible um, for you to understand on which scale we are doing that. Um, I will talk about that in a minute. Um, then we will deal with some quick history. Let me briefly explain what I mean by that. Um, you know, when, when we are talking about the literary periods and the texts, then, then of course we mostly want to focus on these texts and probably find out some characteristics of uh, poetry or general writing of that time. Um, however, to understand some of the uh, contextual circumstances, it's very important to have at least some historical knowledge, some historical background of the time the text was written in um, or composed in. Um, it is just necessary, but you will see this is not going to be a history class. Maybe I'll do another lecture series on British history. We'll see about that. It is very brief and just for your understanding of the time and why certain things in the texts are how they are. Um, I think this is very important. Uh, this will always occur at the first lesson of a period, so we now start talking about Old English literature, so it's important now, but when we speak about Old English literature again next week, we will not do this history thing, so next week will be much shorter than today. Um, but then when we speak about Middle English again, I will put in some history again, and when we talk about modernism much later, I will put some historical um, input in as well, just for you know a general understanding of what's going on in on the British Isles and in the world at that time, but really just brief. I think I, I talked more about what quick history means now than I will actually talk about the history in a minute. Um, then we will have a look at the text Beowulf. Uh, I once again want to emphasize that both the text and a translation to modern day English um, is available on our lecture course 
right? Uh, you can find the link to the lecture course in the video description. And the password is... Oh, I think that's the password. I hope I'm not mistaken. Uh, capital J H M underscore capital B capital L small i small t 21. Uh, I hope uh, it was that. If, if I'm mistaken, you will also find the password in the video description as in, um, you know, uh, just because I might be wrong. Um, yeah, the both a text and a modern day translation are available in on the lecture course. So, um, of course, I would recommend that you read through it before watching this lecture, but I know that BioWorld is not very accessible today and it's also very long. So uh, don't be afraid if you do not know BioWorld, not even the general gist. Um, I think you can still watch today's lecture um, and, and most of the other lectures to come without actually knowing the text. It's always better to, to have read the text before, but I really know that, especially in old English and middle English literature. That is sometimes a little hard, uh, not very accessible. Let me check something. How is temperature going? All right. Uh, my camera might overheat at times. Now, um, back to the topic. Yeah, we will then deal with Beowulf and go into some literary analysis. Uh, we'll talk about that more then. And in the end, um, there is some Kind of interaction again uh, i have prepared some things for you that you can do of course these are all optional offers um, but they might really help you and also help me uh, to see how you will deal with this uh, lecture and stuff so um, yeah we will talk about that in the very end now uh, let's start with a brief recap of um, the last session oh by the way um, I'm very sorry for the delay. As I said in last week's video, I, I was ill for a couple of days and I just couldn't bring myself to capture this lecture. So I decided to um, create a less big video and um, yeah, put that online and delay the lesson by one week. So it's uh, November 30th today. Okay, brief recap. You can see that right here. Um, last week we talked about, for the first time, about British literary period. So um, yeah, basically I gave you like an overview of the chapters that we will be dealing with in the lecture. Of course, we will have um, one or up to four, but mostly two uh, lectures about each of these literary periods. So we talked about Old English, Middle English, Renaissance, Restoration, Enlightenment, Romantic, Victorian, Modernist, and uh, what uh, comes after that. Um, you should, if you could have, well, at least keep these terms in mind, um, but the actual knowledge about these periods and they will come when we will deal with that and you will then see what characteristics are of them and what these periods are basically about, what defines them. Um, yeah, so we are here now in old English literature uh, from 5th century until uh, 1066. But don't worry, it looks much, but we will deal with all of it. Um, I will put these off for now because I don't think we will need them anymore for now. And yeah, that is basically everything I wanted to say about uh, last week's session. Um, I once again want to emphasize there is a document in the um, online learning platform course that I created for you uh, that is called Overview of the uh, British Literary Periods. This document is currently almost empty, like there are all the dates that I just showed you on these cards. They are all on there as well. Um, however, there is also a slide for each and every period, which is empty right now. But after we are finished with each and every period, so for example, next week, next week uh, we will finish with Old English Literature, not next week, but next lecture, right? There will be two lectures about Old English Literature. And after the second lecture about Old English Literature, I will update this overview file that is in the lecture course with uh, general characteristics of Old English literature. So 
that each time when we are done dealing with the period, uh, this file gets updated. So that in the end, when the lecture series is complete, you have a whole overview of uh, general characteristics and examples of these periods. So uh, yeah, that is just an overview for you. But uh, of course, I will not insert all the details in there, just you know, one slide per period, just some general information about that. Okay, now uh, let me talk briefly how long is it? Ugh, dang it. <laughs> um, let me talk briefly about how deep we will go into analyzing texts. I already told you in the first lesson, in the introductory lesson, that our goal is to take away nine aspects from each and every text, right? For each text, also be a wolf, we want three, uh, we want to memorize three things about context history, three things about content theme, and three things about style form. So nine things in general would be great to take away from these lectures per text. Um, now, of course, you don't have to memorize all of that. There will be some mock exams in the end where you can test your knowledge and focus on certain texts, but um, you will not, like, I will, I will not ask you in the end, we, I don't know, we will deal with like 30 texts or so, like, give me nine facts about all of these 30 texts don't worry about that but it's just you know it would be great um, if you could take away all that much from it i would be very happy if that works out that would prove that my lecture works but i'm not sure yet now however um i know people have been asking themselves how deep will this be like will we for example when we later talk about i don't know uh harry potter will we Will we go through each and every chapter? Will we analyze each chapter? And will we characterize each character, each plot and every theme? Will it be that detailed? And the answer to that is, of course not. Um, this is a lecture series and I would really love to keep it, except for this one, to a length of like 40 to 50 minutes. Like an ideal length for an episode would be 45 minutes at maximum, the shorter, the better, because of course I want to give you some, some brief understanding of how a literary analysis on that will go. Um, if I were even on Beowulf, which is not too complex at all, while actually being a little complex, but, but not too complex at all, even there, if I were to analyze or if we were to go into an academic literary analysis on, on in all detail, we would have to write a book of a thousand pages. It just doesn't work like that, um, especially not in a short video like that. It would have to be like a 10 hours video or so, um, or a, a series. And this is um, very important. Also, why it is recommended to read the texts before um, watching the lectures, because then um, it is easier for you to follow because I might at some points rush a little through it, but I will try to keep it um, to an extent where every everyone can follow, uh, also those who have not read the text. Um, also, it's a little hard because there is no direct interaction between you and me. Like there are some possibilities for interaction, but I'm still speaking to a camera now. You are not in a Zoom meeting and we are not in person in a seminar teaching or whatever. So we cannot discuss, we cannot analyze together, but only I can give you input, uh, which is why it's just impossible to, yeah, to, to get to the bottom of everything because I want to make sure that everybody can follow and um, yeah, don't want to skip anything. And uh, it's just, in that format that we are having, it's just impossible to go into every detail. And trust me, you don't want that. And the last thing is uh, that I wrote about that. It's called extra videos and a question mark. Um, what does that mean? It basically means I might do some more detailed literary analysis in the future in another form, not in a lecture form. Um, 
this lecture is supposed to give you an overview, a general understanding and overview about everything that is in the text, but to a level, you know, a, a rather superficial level with some strong details. But I might, for example, if, if there is, uh, I just finished reading Casino Royale a couple of weeks ago and Casino Royale has uh, 27 chapters. So I might at some point in time in a couple of years then start a video series that completely focuses on Casino Royale and there will be one video or there might be one video for each chapter. So 27 videos focusing only each only on one chapter and analyzing it. And then maybe another 10 videos about all the characters and themes and then another video about the style and form and another on the context and another on the period. And then it would be like this 40, 50 video series about just one book. Um, this might happen sometime in the future. It depends on how this channel will develop over the next couple of years. Um, but for now, that is not not really the plan for now. This, this lecture series is important. And now I've talked enough um, about that. Let's blah. Okay. One more thing. Both in the video description as well as in the lecture series, you can find a script. The script is like a PowerPoint presentation that helps you follow this lecture. Because I, I like my whiteboard. I want to use that. I want to write on here. I don't want to be just in a corner talking and there is a PowerPoint presentation all over the screen. But there is a kind of PowerPoint presentation that you can download and use while watching this uh, lecture series and also make your own notes on that. And to show you how this works and how this really works in a great way, um, today I, I will make some references to that. So please download the script. It's in the video description or in lecture course. Um, Maybe have it on your phone while watching on the computer, or if you have two monitors, put the video on one, the uh, script on the other, however you want to deal with that. And I will make some uh, references, uh, some direct references to this script um, to show you how it is really supportive to have um, when watching this lecture. But this will not be the case in the future. Like these scripts will always be there for each and every lecture, but I will only make these direct references today to show you um, really how this helps and that I really recommend doing it. Now, let's start with our actual topic today. We will start, as I said, with, oh, um, with uh, some quick history. So I want to give you um, some historical background uh, for the time of like 5th century to 1066, so the period of Old English literature. Um, that is not directly connected to Beowulf or to any of the literature, but it is important for your um, understanding, as I said before. Now, um, and here you have a good overview of that on uh, slide number seven, if you open the script or page number seven. Um, it basically gives you everything that I'm going to say now. And uh, there is also a, uh, an image that illustrates what I'm about to say. So um, the first people on the British Isles were Celtic settlers. They um, came there around, yeah, like fifth, sixth, seventh century, uh, no. That, that's so wrong of what I just said, I'm sorry. Um, like around 600 before Christ, actually, they, they've already been there. Um, not 6th century, I have no idea where that came from, sorry. Um, and they were there until there was contact to the Roman Empire. You know, the Roman Empire constantly tried to extend and uh, Julius Caesar actually tried to uh, conquer the British Isles, however, it was unsuccessful. That was around uh, just shortly before Christ, like 50, 55 before Christ, I think. Um, but then uh, the Emperor Claudius was successful in conquering the British Isles, um, actually the lowlands of, uh, British, of the British Isles, um, around 40 something before Christ. And this is important because until 
the next people, so to say, came to the British Isles. Um, you know, the Roman Empire was a pagan uh, empire. So this was their uh, religious understanding. And of course, this had uh, an impact on uh, society, society uh, on the British Isles. Until then, a uh, much later, around 450 um, AD, so no longer before Christ, um, some groups from uh, the, the, the continent came and took over uh, the British Isles. Those were the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes, and they um, split the uh, British Isles into seven parts and created their own little seven kingdoms there, so to say. And um, yeah, that was called the uh, Heptarchy. You can now um, have a look at the slide number seven. And uh, if you are asking yourselves now, who the hell are the Angles? Who are the Saxons? Who are the Jews? How the hell does that work? Um, who are they? Um, you can have a look at the slide number seven. There is a, a good picture that shows you where they came from, right? So, um, for example, the Jutes came from what is still uh, called, I think, Jutland today, um, the main continent part of Denmark. And uh, yeah, the Angles and the Saxons came from where nowadays uh, will be Germany. So those settled um, after the Roman Empire failed, fall, fell, they uh, settled on the British Isles and yeah, created their own society um, under a heptarchy. Right. The main difference that made for uh, people on the British Isles were that unlike the Romans who were there before, the uh, Anglo Saxons and Jews were Christian. Um, that means that the people on the British Isles were basically Christianized and all the life there was Christianized and that this Christianization, this um, time of uh, transition from paganism to Christianity has a huge impact on old English literature. You will see that again when we have a look at Beowulf. Now, um, that developed over a couple of hundred, a couple, couple of hundred years um, while the Jews only had like one of these uh, seven tiny kingdoms, so to say. Um, the others, so the Angles and the Saxons had more and almost uh, and also uh, the biggest ones, which is why the British Isles uh, were then called like the Anglo-Saxon, um, an Anglo-Saxon area because they were just, you know, having more power than the Jews. The Jews were basically left out um, of that name. Then in the late 8th century, I think around uh, 793, if I'm not mistaken, um, there were Viking raids on the British Isles. That means uh, people from Norway, Sweden and Denmark came to the British Isles and they just uh, settled there um, until this was no longer just settling, but actually they wanted to take over, you know. It is what it was in those times. Doesn't work like that anymore today, at least not everywhere in the world. And um, yeah, those tribes started fighting the Anglo-Saxon people. And there was a, in German, we would say a hin und her. I just don't know the English term for that right now. Um, at first, the English king fought them back, but then there was Knut the Great who fought them back until again Edward the Confessor fought them back again. And then suddenly the Norman people came and there was the Battle of Hastings in 1066, which ended the Old English literature, but uh, the Old English period. But um, I just dropped so many words, the Normans 1066 Battle of Hastings. We will not talk about that today. Uh, because uh, this is important for the next literary period. So we will talk about that when we will talk about Middle English uh, literature. So basically what was important, first there were Celtic settlers, then the Roman Empire with paganist view came, then the 
um, Brahmin Empire fell and the Anglo-Saxons took over, so to say, um, with Christian views, so people there changed from paganism to Christianity, and then there were the Viking raids, and even another group of people wanted to take over the British Isles. So yeah, uh, people really wanted the British Isles. And uh, people with very different backgrounds and very different minds and thoughts. Okay, we have been talking enough about other things now, so let's get to our example that we will be talking about today. That is Beowulf. Now, many of you might have heard the term Beowulf, but I know that many aren't really sure. Is Beowulf an author? Is Beowulf a historical or mythological um, creature or character? Or is it the name of a story? And if so, who's the author? And we will answer some of these questions now, of course. Um, first of all, very important, Beowulf is um, the name of the story. So Beowulf is a verse in um, a text in Old English verse of over 3000 lines. So it's, a, it's quite a long poem, so to say. And um, the story's name is Beowulf as the main character there is also co called Beowulf, but not the author. And this is where we come to a very important thing of old English literature. And that is what my slide number nine talks about it. If you open the script again, have a look at it. You can also see there how the manuscript of Beowulf looks like. So um, let me talk about that first. Beowulf itself was probably created around the mid eighth century. Now think again about what we learned about quick history. What was going on then? Right, it was already Anglo-Saxon um, British Isles. That's important when we when we talk about the content and uh, what Old English verse is. We will talk about that again when we talk about style and form. Now, uh, on the slide nine, you can see the manuscript. But what kind of manuscript is this? Because this is not the original version, the original creation of Beowulf. Um, now, you see, as I just said, it was probably composed around the mid 8th century, but was written down around the year of 1000. Um, as you can imagine, that's quite late. That is if, as if you were going onto the streets now and tell a story to someone and uh, they retell it over and over again until eventually in 2,221 someone decides, mm, yep, I uh, write that down, that story that stranger told on the street 200 years ago. You see, that is not really a thing that happens today, right? Because nowadays we write everything down instantly or um, record it with our devices that we have, either a camera or a microphone or whatever. And you see, that was different back then. In old English times, so from the 5th century until the early 11th century or mid 11th century, you know, that was not a thing. There were no cameras, there were no microphones, and it was also a rarity that anything was written down because only very very few people actually knew how to write and had the material to it also uh, the material that was written on was so expensive that um, it really was a huge decision to write something down um, especially before the year of 1000 um, i will talk about this uh, this this notion of uh, scribing um, again, when we talk about context of Middle English literature, because it's even more present then. But um, for the time being, especially the creation of Beowulf now, it's important that you keep in mind that around 250 years passed from the original uh, composition of Beowulf until the manuscript that was written down that we now have today and can have a look at, which you can also see a page of. 
um, on slide number nine. Um, this manuscript, the original written manuscript of Beowulf was also almost destroyed and some parts of it were actually destroyed in the fire in 751. So um, not everything from this manuscript is still there today. You know, if you were to write a story now and you would publish it on the internet, but then your original manuscript would get destroyed, nobody would care, you know, it's on the internet and it's copied like a thousand times. Um, obviously not the same thing back then. And even copying Beowulf only happened way later. Like now, if we type in Beowulf now, um, as you can see in the lecture course as well, there's this online document of it. That's not going to be destroyed. But the source for it um, is the only thing that is still there from back then. Now, if you were to ask, so who wrote it? Who is the original author of Beowulf? I would have to say just get this thought out of your mind because um, as I just said, old English literature, old English period, not much writing. So there was an oral culture. That means texts that were created, that were composed in a way, right? Not written down, but composed. Um, they were spoken and it was not like that there was one original creator who came up with a story and then the story was retold exactly like that over the time until 250 years later it was written down no so we have to um, when we think about we beowulf as we know it now so from the manuscript of around the year 1000 that you can see on slide number nine um this is a version that does not just come from one person, but from many, many people over the 250 years. And there is no way of telling how the original Beowulf story actually looked like. It's, it's an impossible thing to do because we only have this manuscript from, one, from around 1000, but we know it's been there for over 250 years. That means that the original Beowulf might have just been a song of three lines, but then it kept going and everyone was adding three lines and then there were suddenly a thousand people adding three lines. So uh, all of a sudden it was 3000 plus lines long. Uh, we don't know that. And also some of the themes that we will talk about when we talk about themes um, might have not even been there in the original version and just came into existence over these years of retelling. And I think this is quite remarkable that the story even survived for that long. I mean, really, if you were going on the streets now and just uh, telling a story and nobody would write it down, nobody would record it for 250 years, this story would not survive. Nobody in the year of 2300 would know that story. This is just not how our cultural or literal um, world works today and this is why we have to um, acknowledge that literature as such in these times had a completely different notion so um, when you think of when you when you pose this question to yourself who is the author of Beowulf you are thinking in a modern notion of what literature is and how literature is created but people back then they they you know they didn't have these notions and these ideas of what literature is this whole um, term literature wasn't a thing until I think 17th century or so. Um, so um, yeah, you have to view this from a completely different perspective. And this is why if we have, if we were to give an author of Beowulf, we would always say anonymous or unknown. Um, we wouldn't write collective work because this is just an assumption. So uh, yeah, unknown or anonymous is probably the best way to describe it. But usually we just say, we just speak about Beowulf. And uh, there is a nice quote by Haruko Moma on your slide number 10. I will read it out to you um, that nicely describes uh, this way of how also Beowulf probably changed over these 250 years. We could perhaps compare an old English poem 
to medieval architecture, whose material was taken from diverse locations and place and time, and whose construct has been repeatedly altered by renovations, additions, and demolitions, an aggregate rather than an authority. Yeah, so it's important when we speak about Beowulf, do not think of an authority that created it, and especially not the version from 1000. By the way, I, I just want to say um, I'm not using my whiteboard very much today, and you might be asking yourself, why the hell do I even have a whiteboard if I only write down the schedule? Um, that is, as I said in the beginning before, uh, today I reference to the slides, um, and since I will not do that in the future, um, I today just want to use this as basic material. In future lectures, I might also print out one of the pictures I have in, on the slides and put them here or write down some of the notes um, on cards, for example, like uh, we did with these things. So I will use the whiteboard again, but not as much today. Um, but that leads me to a, another thing about this oral literary culture of um, Old English that I want to speak about. Um, you might ask yourself, how the hell would people even memorize the story for over 200 years? And uh, the answer to that is that since there were not these uh, possibilities of capturing or writing down each and every story, each and every idea, each and every poem and song and whatever, um, it was composed uh, mostly in a way to be memorized. Um, so. Uh, Beowulf might have been invented as a song, for example, that was told when people were sitting at a campfire and someone was starting to sing about an heroic tale of Beowulf in Denmark. Um, or it might have been a bard on the streets, uh, even though I'm not sure if the job of a bard uh, was actually there already at that time, I'm not too sure. Um, so yeah, and you will see when, when we talk about the style and form of Beowulf, how this has been done. So what um, methods have been used to make it memorizable. And uh, yeah, but I think so much about the context. We will now go over to the content of Beowulf. I just want to say again, um, when we think about quick history, um, right? what I gave you just a couple of minutes ago, we were saying, um, or I was presenting to you that the British Isles were at a phase of transition during that time from paganism to Christianity. I just want to throw this in again into this context section, section because it is an important contextual effect for Beowulf. And when we will talk about the content in a second, you will realize now, I have contextualized Beowulf a little for you, and we've talked about the period, the time, and so on. But now I want you to uh, kind of listen to what Beowulf sounds like, or what Old English sounds like. Um, sadly, I, I have a book, um, the translation by Seamus Heaney, and uh, there's also the original Old English version in it. Um, but sadly, I have given it uh, to a friend of mine right now because he's doing some studies in Beowulf. So um, I do not have it here right now. Um, so I just uh, printed out a part of the text, which I still had um, on my computer from uh, university uh, seminars, um, also including a part of Heaney's uh, translation. So I only have this now, but um, in, next, in the next lecture, um, I might present to you my book of uh, Seamus Heaney. Just want to show it to you um, but I'm realizing it's getting darker now let me try to fix the lights okay probably not much better but I will now uh, try to read try to read to you um, first the first three lines of Beowulf in the original old English version and then also the fourth one even though it's just half a sentence I uh, want to introduce it because we will um, come to it uh, also when we when we talk about style. I want to introduce this fourth one there as well. Um, 
If you want to read it with me, you can go to the lecture course now and uh, there is a document there that or a link there that um, leads you to the original text. Um, but the first four lines are also on my slide number 13. Um, even though that's the slide about style, so you might not want to spoil yourself. Um, but if you don't want to open the uh, original text, you can also have a look at there. So, um, my old English is not very good. I'm very sorry, but I will try to uh, read out the first four lines to you now. Hvat we gardena in yerdagum theot siniga thrymi frunon hu tha e thelingos elen fremedon. Those were the first three lines, but also I want to go for the fourth one. Of chilled shaving, she theana threatum. Okay. So you might not have understood a word. So uh, let me also read to you the translation of the first three lines by Seamus Heaney. So the spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. Well, I can also give you the translation of the fourth line, even though it doesn't make any sense because it's just the beginning of the passage. But it is, uh, there was shield, chasen, scourge of many tribes, and that is about one of the warrior kings of uh, Denmark, or, um, yeah, the Danes back then, um, yeah, had this notion of, of kings being like warrior kings, and one of them was uh, shield Schäfing. Um no, uh, shield Schäfsen, that is uh, how we would call it in modern English, but then it was shield Schäfing in um, Old English. So yeah, just uh, so that you have an understanding of how Old English sounds like when spoken. It's completely different um, than today's English. Um, however, when, when we come to Middle English literature, so the, the lecture after the next, uh, there you will see how, the, how today's English uh, came into existence. But that's not uh, the topic for today. Let's get to some content and theme analysis on Beowulf. Now, as I said before, it would be helpful if you already read and kind of understood Beowulf. Like, of course, it would suffice if you read a translation, either the free one that is in the lecture course or the... Uh, not free one by Seamus Heaney, um, but it's not very important. So let me give you a brief overview. Um, Beowulf is set in Scandinavia, and um, Beowulf understands or uh, yeah, gets the knowledge that uh, the Danes, under the rule of King Hrothgar, um, are in trouble because uh, King Hrothgar uh, built a hall called called. Uh, Herod, um, which actually existed, by the way. And this hall is uh, threatened by a monster called Grendel. And it's not just a, a man or a woman called Grendel, no, it's actually a monster. This is, by the way, where we uh, understand that there is pagan influence, so uh, from the Roman Empire, because uh, the, the pagan um, views had lots of mythology uh, you know when you think about Roman mythology right so there were lots of uh, monsters and supernatural themes while uh, Christianity did not really have these anymore like of course there were some uh, supernatural themes even in uh, Christian beliefs but there were no uh, dragons and monsters and whatevers, right? But paganism had these monsters, uh, these creatures, these mythological creatures, um, which is where we see the influence of paganism. Also, Beowulf is set in the pagan times, so in the pre-Christian times, before the Anglo-Saxons and the Jews um, came to the British Isles. But you can clearly see that there is influence of Christian themes to these 
to this uh, pre-Christian, so this pagan story. And that is, for example, by um, having a look at who Grendel is. You know, Han Grendel, Handel, Grendel, <laughs> sorry, Handel is a musician. Um, no, Grendel, the monster Grendel is not just any monster that is just randomly there attacking the Danes and uh, yeah, killing lots and lots of Danes. No, it's actually the descendant of Cain. And uh, Cain, as you might now, uh, as you might know, is part of the Old Testament of the book of Genesis. Uh, he was uh, the first um, murderer in the Bible. He killed his own brother, even though I think the motives are not quite clear, and was cast out by God. Um, yeah, and then he obviously had children, and one of them was the monster Grendel, at least in Beowulf. So this is uh, where the first uh, chapter um, of... Beowulf begins. Um, this is, by the way, a thing that you could remember for your um, for your three things about style um, is always the the structure. So Beowulf, I will already say this now, is um, generally structured into three parts, uh, three different battles. So one third, uh, the, the first battle with Grendel is, so to say, the first part of the story, and then there are two other battles that are these three chapters, so to say, in Beowulf. So that would be a thing of form and style, the macro structure, so to say, of um, Beowulf. So this first part is then concerned with the battle between Beowulf and Grendel. It is a hard fight, but um, Beowulf also uh, possesses kind of supernatural powers because he goes into battle without armor and without a sword or whatever. And he actually kills Grendel not by having a good fight, a good sword duel with it or so. No, he rips its arm off and then it bleeds to death. And this is how Grendel dies. And of course, uh, the people of uh, Denmark and King Rothgar, they are so grateful and they give him treasure and stuff. However, there is Grendel's mother, who is not very pleased to hear that her childish, child monster-ish thing got killed in battle. So it seeks revenge and uh, Beowulf gets to know that and follows Grendel's mother, who is by the way, I think just called Grendel's mother, uh, into an underwater cave where it lives, or she lives, hard to say because it's a monster do you say she or it uh, i would go for she now because it is grendel's mother um and uh, he also kills her in a battle this time again uh, there, there is a battle and he um realizes he can't really hurt her but then in her own cave there is her own supernatural magical sword so he takes it and cuts her head off and uh, so Grendel's mother dies. A second big monster killed. The Danes are very happy to hear that. Um, with the same sword, by the way, he goes back to Grendel's corpse and cuts his half, his head off as well and takes it as a trophy. Um, yeah, very bloody tale, you can say, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, once again, the Danes are pretty thankful, give him all the treasure he wants. I think Beowulf then becomes king of Denmark as well. And there is a big time skip of, oh, I'm not sure, I think 40 to 50 years, sometimes around then. I think Beowulf is 50 over the time, or it was a time skip of 50 years. I'm not sure about that right now, sorry. Um, but then again, there is a third battle, and this is the third part of the story after... <laughs> maybe you will notice something in a second. Um, there is a thief in Denmark, and he goes to a cave where a dragon lives, and he steals the treasure of the dragon, and that really angers the dragon, so the dragon starts attacking the Danes. Which is when a Beowulf, who is however very old now, strikes back you might realize that there is a tiny connection between Beowulf and Tolkien's The Hobbit. 
And actually, this is not the only reference from The Hobbit to Old English literature, as we will see again next week. Very important. Um, we will also have a lecture on The Fellowship of the Ring um, or The Hobbit. I'm not too sure yet. Uh, so, yeah, we will talk about that again. But um, if you are interested in Lord of the Rings, you might be interested in the sources of Tolkien and Old English literature. However, um, there is a battle against the dragon then. And it's not too successful at the start because uh, unlike in the first two battles in the story, Beowulf goes fighting it with a group of people. Yeah, sadly my camera overheated again. I don't know what the last thing was that you heard. But um, what I wanted to say is the dragon was quite big and dangerous and uh, frightening. And that's why most of the companions of um, Beowulf fled, uh, except for one, whose name is Wiglaf, and uh, he stood and fought together with him, um, the dragon. In the end, they defeated the dragon, but then in the end, um, a wound caused by the dragon turns out to be poisonous and Beowulf dies. His corpse then gets burnt uh, on a uh, How's it called in English? Seebestattung. A um, like on. Um, they put his corpse in a boat, with treasure, and bring it onto the sea and let it burn there on the boat. You know, I don't know the term for it. Only the German term, which is Seebestattung, but that's probably not going to help some of you. Um, yeah. So uh, that leads us. I'm sorry, I wrote down some things while my camera was cooling down. Um, Leads us to the macrostructure of Grendel, Grendel's mother dragon. So these are the three battles in Beowulf. And uh, some major themes that occur in the story is, of course, heroism. Beowulf as the hero to come and save uh, King Hrothgar and the Danes. Um, transition from paganism to Christianization. We talked about that. Uh, mythology, Christian, Christianity, right? Uh, battles, obviously. Also loyalty is a, is a theme because, uh, first of all, Beowulf stays loyal to uh, the Danes. Um, when protecting them over and over again. And also in the end, Wycliffe stays loyal to Beowulf in the final battle. But then, of course, death is also a theme of <clears throat> Beowulf. Now, let's get to the final part of our analysis. And I will try to make it as quick as possible. But it is still important to have a look at it. But it's, but it's okay when we um, make the style part a little quicker today. Because in the next lecture, we will again talk about a uh, an old English poem, which is way shorter, by the way, 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 way shorter, like way shorter. Um, and the formal analysis there is quite similar. So it's okay if we are making it a little shorter today. Now, um, I would like you to open the script again and have another look at slide number 13. Because there, just like here, you have the first four lines. Um, I just realized why have I put them here if I wanted to work with the script today. Um, and we will now come to a general definition of the Old English verse. Now, as you might have seen, if you, oh, you probably might not have seen it when you read through the Beowulf that is available for free that I put into the Moodle course, but um, where is it again? Right. In this one, this is also from Seamus Heaney's book. I don't know if you can really see it, probably not. Maybe. Yeah, you can see it a little, but also on uh, slide number 11 and also here. One thing that is very important and very standard for all English literature is uh, or are the so-called Old English long lines. So one line of a poem usually consists of two half lines, one here, one there. And in the middle, there is space. And uh, this space is called a, a caesura, a caesura, sorry. And um, basically, it is just a pause. Um, where we today would probably have this as line one, this is line two or the like um, to emphasize there is a pause in between or um, put a, a, you know, this or whatever. Um, but no, they left 
some space in between the uh, caesura. And uh, this is a very common thing in Old English literature. We will see it again in the next lecture. And then you might wonder, now, how is this memorizable? We uh, said this before, um, and we talked about oral literary culture. Um, the thing is, nowadays, we are very used to end rhymes. Like, for example, uh, we would say, I don't know, me and he rhyme so if a, uh, uh, I cannot come up with an example like that. Okay, you know, but you know what an end rhyme is like, right? When when at, a, at the end of a line, there is a word or a sound, and then the next line ends with the same, and this is where the rhyme occurs. This is what most people understand when just saying rhyme was well, actually just an end rhyme. Now you would say, "Had we Gardena in Yerdagum, they are Sininga Thrymifrunon." That does not have any rhyme, but you are mistaken because uh, this has a so-called initial rhyme. So a rhyme at the start. Um, uh, that is wrong. Sorry. Um, at the start of the half lines, those rhyme, but not in the way that we are used to when thinking about end rhymes. But they are initial rhymes, so they rhyme via alliterations. So an alliteration, in case you don't know, is basically when two words or two lines start with the same letter or the same sound. So, um, for example, uh, yeah, we have that here. When Gardena and Yerdagum you see, Gardena, Gar, Yer, Dena, Dagum, they start with the same word and almost the same sound, so they are alliterative. And this is what creates an initial rhyme. And this was actually the most common rhyme scheme in Old English literature. Um, this has changed quite, quite a while. Nowadays, if you yeah, would give this to someone, they would say, no, that doesn't rhyme. But yes, it does, just in another way that we are used to. But as I said before, they had different notions of literature and everything. And this was normal for them. So this was memorable for them. Um, yeah. What else is there to say? I will speak about stressed syllables more in next lecture. Yeah. Um, actually, each of these half lines has two stressed syllables. Um, so four per long line. Um, but I will not speak about that now. We will we will talk a little more about this uh, these uh, old English long lines in the next lecture. Um, would be fitting there in a better way, also because we can analyze a whole poem next time and not just the first four lines. But also uh, you can see like we we can go on. There's uh, Theod, Thrym. Uh, there is. Ethelingas and Ellen, or E, Ethelingas, yeah, and from it on, we have Shield Chafing and Shea Thena, Threatum. You see, there are lots of uh, alliterations in there, and yeah, this is the type of rhyme scheme that, that we have in Beowulf. And this is what was so memorizable um, for the people back then that it kept being in existence for over 200 years. And um, there is one more thing that is very, very, very characteristic for Old English literature and very important, and that is the so-called cannings. If you now have a look at a slide 14, this is the last um, about content of today's lecture, almost done, um, you can see some examples of cannings. Now, what are cannings? Cannings are basically um, content words that are um, indirect paraphrases in a figurative way. So um, it is a little similar to a metaphor where something that you say stands for something else, but it is a little more direct by just paraphrasing it. So it's not completely different, but actually very close to the actual meaning. Uh, one example would be, um, you know, the, the sea or the ocean, right? You all know what this is. 
big pile of water. Um, in Beowulf, for example, this would not be described just as sea or ocean, but it would be described as a whale road. So a road where whales pass. You see? This is obviously not a river. I haven't seen a whale passing a river before, but uh, the ocean. And uh, yeah, this is what a canning is. And there are lots of examples in Beowulf. Like for example, oh, by the way, um, if you want the old English version of whale road, it is uh, Ronrat. Um, yeah, uh, another uh, canning for the sea is also the Swan Road, uh, so uh, the um, Swanrat. And to give you some other examples, I have some written down here. Uh, Beowulf himself is often not described as Beowulf, but as Yoldifan, which basically means giver of gold. And uh, the king is called the giver of rings or the giver of treasure. Um, God is called um, the guardian of mankind or Mankin is word. Um, a corpse, yeah, like a, a dead body. It's not called a dead body, but a raven harvest. And blood is not called blood, but battle sweat. So the sweating of a battle, so to say. Or well, the sun is called a sky candle. A sword is a light of battle. Um, yeah. Or a human body. This is also a very uh, interesting thing. A human body, like... This here is called a banhus, which means a bone house. And uh, yeah, those cannings are really impressive in my opinion. And this is very characteristic. If you read through uh, Beowulf, all the translation, you can basically see uh, one of these every few lines because there are so many and it is a very, very common thing um, instead of using metaphors in these times. Now, I feel like uh, my camera battery is almost empty, so I will make a short little cut and then we will come to the end. But it's important, it's, it's last but not least. Um, we are basically done with Beowulf, I will just summarize it in a sentence or two. But there is this part, and this is very important this time, I really, really uh, hope that you are uh, sticking until the end and we will see you in a second. Okay, um, hello again. Uh, you might not see me right now. This is because I have completely failed loading my camera. Uh, I load, I, you know, I put the camera on the cable, but then took the battery out. So of course the camera can load the battery when the battery's not in there. And uh, it's been like this for two hours now and now it's dark outside. And I was wondering while well, the battery is still at zero percent. So I decided to just, um, give you the part of the script now. I didn't want to do that, but I do it now uh, as a picture and I'm just talking and you can't see me. But since uh, there's only like five or maybe 10 minutes left, I think it's okay for now. Um, so to summarize real quick what we did today, uh, now I have to look at the whiteboard behind me. Um, we talked about, first of all, um, how deep our analysis will go. I um, gave you a brief overview of history. I hope you still remember that. If not, um, go to the start of this script uh, that you can download in the video description. Um, and then you can have a look at it again. Um, and then we have been talking about Beowulf. We contextualized it. So uh, we were especially talking about oral um, literature, oral literary culture, in the old English times. We were talking about how Beowulf was created and how it might have changed over over 200 years. We have talked about transition from paganism to Christianity, which is also a theme. Um, yeah, then we have summarized the content, the three battles of Beowulf versus Grendel, Grendel's mother and the dragon, and also talked about many of the themes of which uh, some are uh, mythology, uh, battle, loyalty, heroism, and death. Uh, of course, if I were to ask you in a mock exam, um, if you could elaborate on maybe one theme of Beowulf, I would not expect you to just say one theme is death. No, but of course I would 
it would be good if you remembered uh, theme is death because uh, there are three monsters that get killed many danes that get killed and in the end beowulf which is the main character so it's very important um that death is a major theme of beowulf you know just elaborate a little on that but uh still these mock, mock exams are completely optional um and then we've also talked about the style we've briefly um spoken about the old english long lines and its kind of initial rhyme um we will talk about it again in the next lecture but for now um i want to leave you with some um, optional offers of interaction uh first of all please enroll to the lecture course. Uh, the link is in the video description, uh, the password as well. It is completely free and there's so much material in there you can use. It is, um, I put so much work in there, so I'd really appreciate if you make use of that work. And this is also where you find uh, all the lectures, all the scripts, all the texts we're dealing with and so on, the syllabus and uh, some discussion forum and so on. You, there's lots of stuff there and it's really useful. Um, second, there is a slide on table 14. You might have seen that when we were spoken, uh, when we were speaking uh, about the style of Beowulf. Um, that is a list of cannings. Maybe you still remember uh, the cannings I've been talking about. So these content words like a whale wrote for the sea or a um, Uh, uh, Ronrad, sorry, uh, <laughs> couldn't seem to uh, remember it right now, but now I do. Um, and you can fill out this table if you want. Um, if you download the script as a PDF and you open the PDF on your computer, uh, then this table is also interactive. So you can just click into the table, uh, type your answers in and save it. Um, so you don't have to print it out or whatever. Uh, you can actually fill it out, uh, this part. I've made it a an interactive PDF file. Um, and then there's something else in the Moodle, uh, not Moodle course, sorry, in the online lecture course, uh, underneath this lecture of Beowulf, there is a file called One Minute Paper. Um, this is also an interactive PDF. You can download it. And this is for yourself to summarize uh, what you have taken from this. So um, if you download it, you will see that there is um, a part for context, a part for content, and a part for style, um, each with three points where you can type in what you remember for each of them. And then also at the bottom, there is another field for other notes uh, where you can yeah, write in other things that uh, you have taken from this lecture and that you uh, remember. This is, of course, an optional offer. It's just for yourself. Um, it helps you memorizing it and if you were to participate in the optional mock exam in the end, um, then this would be your perfect opportunity to uh, create, you know, like learning material for yourself. And uh, if you want, you can also send in your filled out one minute paper to me. Um, of course, you don't have to, it's only for yourself. But if you send it to me, either via the discussion forum or uh, the uh, email, um, section. Um, there's also a, a direct upload function underneath the one minute paper. Um, if you send in these and put your mail address in there, then I can give you direct feedback. Of course, you don't have to. As I said before, this one minute paper is just for yourself. Um, but yeah, if you send it to me, I can have a look at it and tell you that's good. And maybe that's lacking a little and you could do that instead. Or maybe that's super, that's right, that's wrong. Um, yeah, this is your opportunity to get direct feedback if you want to participate in that way, um, which of course you don't have to, but these are um, your optional offers for interaction. This is it for this week. Thank you for your attention. In the script, you can uh, find another three slides of my sources, uh, cited sources, material sources, and further reading for you. And uh, in the next lecture, we will once again deal with Old English Literature. It's called Old English Literature 2. And we will deal with Catman's Hymn, which is a very short poem. Uh, I think it's less than 10 lines long. 
So we can definitely have a look at the whole poem this time, unlike with Beowulf. And uh, yeah, you will... I think you will like this lecture, the next one, and it's also going to be much, much shorter than today. So yeah, thank you for your inten attention. <laughs> intention. Attention, my name is Jeff H. Mellon, and uh, read you all soon. Bye-bye.